Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet 3rd Class Carter Margolis. Welcome to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. It is my privilege to welcome you and our guest speaker, Colonel Retired Lee Van Arsdell. Having spent 11 years in the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta Airborne, Colonel Van Arsdell has since retired from his 25-year Army career. He served in three combat services holding leadership positions and was decorated for his valor with the Silver Star and Purple Heart for wounds he received in combat. He also was a part of numerous classified operations on a global scale holding leadership positions within these endeavors. Following his impressive military career, Colonel Van Arzel became the Assistant General Manager for National Security Response at the Bechtel Nevada Corporation. He founded a private consulting firm, the Unconventional Solutions Incorporated, and was a founding director of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Institute for Security, for Security Studies. He was the Chief Executive Officer of Triple Canopy Incorporated, an integrated security solutions company, and the Chief Executive Officer of Creative Radicals, a software company. He now serves on the boards of select companies and does volunteer work for veterans organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you Colonel Retired Lee Van Arsdell. Hello, everyone. It's an honor for me to be with you here today. I'm looking forward to talking to you. I'm an old soldier, and what old soldiers do is tell war stories. So I'm going to tell you a cool war story today. There's a theme to it. If you look at the Army warrior ethos, it's four simple points. I'll always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit and I will never leave a fallen comrade. I'm gonna focus on that last point, never leave a fallen comrade. And I'll make the argument that even though it's the warrior ethos, these points cover everyday life, not just time and combat. So getting the job done is always crucial. Never quitting, certainly words to live by. Never accept defeat, never accept failure and never leave a fallen comrade. That doesn't just mean someone who's been killed on the battlefield. That means a comrade who may be going through a rough stretch right now. Maybe a comrade who's got a problem with alcohol. Maybe it's a comrade with problems at home or in a relationship. You never leave them. So with that in mind, I wanna tell you about my time as a member of Task Force Ranger, Somalia in 1993. Many of you have read the book and or seen the movie Black Hawk Down. That was a story of Task Force Ranger. Our mission was quite simple and straightforward. Kill or capture General Muhammad Farah ID. So what's going on at this point in time? Somalia is in the midst of a civil war. It has no central government. It's a clan-based society and the clans all have their own well-armed militias. They're fighting for supremacy to see who takes over the country. In the midst of this, the Habergator militia led by General Muhammad Farah Aidid ambushed and massacred two dozen Pakistani peacekeepers who were there with the United Nations. The United States decided that they had to, had to do something about this. And so Task Force Ranger was formed from the U.S. Army Rangers, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and the Delta Force, the first Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. The goal, as I said, very simple and straightforward, kill or capture Muhammad Farah ID. We had no idea where he was after the June 1993 massacre. So we gave ourselves one week to find him. And if in that period of time, we didn't know where he was, then we would go to plan B, which was to start to take out his infrastructure. We would capture those people who were important to his success. One of our missions was we took out the radio station that he used to broadcast propaganda and instructions to his troops who are still fighting a civil war. So it was that on the 3rd of October, 1993, we got intelligence that we figured we could act on to capture two of his key lieutenants. This is exactly in line with what we were doing at that point in time everything to put pressure on him to bring him to the surface. So we conducted a successful mission. In less than 20 minutes, 
the Delta Force went into a multi-story building, multi-building compound after the two key lieutenants, each of whom had approximately a dozen well-armed bodyguards with them. And while this was going on, the Rangers fast roped down to four positions to provide external security while the mission was accomplished. At this point in time, I'll show you an overhead image that we have of Mogadishu at that time, just to give you a feel for how dense an urban environment this is. You've got the Delta target area and you've got the four Ranger positions. Now, while this was a textbook mission and was accomplished in less than 20 minutes, the Black Hawk helicopters that had inserted the Rangers were circling the target area, providing sniper support to the task force ranger element that was on the ground. One of these helicopters piloted by Cliff Walcott was shot down. That changed everything. In the words of General Garrison, the task force commander, we just lost the initiative. So now it's incumbent upon us to get the initiative back. We had contingency plans, of course, one of which was a combat search and rescue helicopter with 15 operators on the back of it. We also had a quick reaction force in the form of the U.S. Army 10th Mountain Division, who was in Somalia supporting the United Nations. So the CSAR bird immediately went to the site of the down helicopter and fast rope down there to get there and provide security before the Somali militia could get there. If the Somali militia could get the, the people on the helicopter and the helicopter itself, that would be a tremendous propaganda coup for them. So we had to get there, not just to prevent that, but to take care of our people. We had the pilot, co-pilot, two crew chiefs and four Delta snipers on board that helicopter. When it crashed, the pilot and co-pilot did everything exactly right to save everyone on board, which they did at the cost of their own lives. The helicopter went down nose first and crushed the pilot and co-pilot, killing them instantaneously. The two crew chiefs and the four snipers all survived. So now it's a race to get there before the militia does. Fortunately, our guys got there first. We were able to secure the site and that gave time for the 10th Mountain Division, our quick reaction force to go in. During this, I was the officer in charge of the Joint Operations Center. General Garrison told me when the quick reaction force came to our Joint Operations Center to effect last minute coordination, go with them. Those were his instructions to me. So. The quick reaction force went out, ran into a well-laid ambush. We had no armored vehicles. Uh, we fought our way out of that, but the commander decided that the best course of action was to return to the base, refit, rearm, and try something different. So that's exactly what we did. This time we enlisted the help of Malaysian armored personnel carriers and Pakistani tanks. We went back out again. This time I found myself rather than riding in the back of a Humvee pickup, standing up, leaned over the cab, in the back of a Malaysian armored personnel carrier, Soviet made. I never dreamt that would happen. But it, it was a pretty nice feeling when you could hear the bullets plinking off the side, not even denting it. So our plan was to go to a position, if you remember where the Olympic Hotel was on the overhead imagery that you saw, we went to a position about 400 meters due south of that. At this point in time, we had two down helicopters, one to the northeast, one to the southwest, about equidistant from our stop point. I decided to go with the 10th Mountain Division element that was going to the first crash site because that's where all our people were. By this time, the Ranger security elements and the Delta assault team had moved by foot to help secure the helicopter. I thought that my best position, the, the, the highest and best use for me at this point in time was to prevent any fratricide, no blue on blue. And if you can just put yourself in that city, by this time it's night, there's gunfire, machine gun fire, rifle propelled grenades, fire from the helicopters in support of us coming from the air. It's a dark, noisy, chaotic situation. So the chance for the element that I was with moving into the downed helicopter that was secured by the task force ranger personnel, very high for fratricide. So that's what I focused on preventing. 
I'm very happy to say that we were successful at that. There was not a single instance of that. So as we moved forward on foot, because we could no longer stay in the vehicles due to the uh, fiery roadblocks, we got pinned down from fire by the Olympic Hotel. The company commander told me that uh, he could no longer move forward because the Malaysian armored personnel carriers with us refused to move forward. So this to me was a fairly easy problem to solve. I had Matt Ryerson, one of the Delta operators with me, a proven performer of exceptional abilities, get in the lead APC, I told him to make that go. And I went to the front of the line of the 10th Mountain Division and merely said, let's go. I knew they would follow me. So in that manner, we got to the crash site. I stopped the element short about a block and a half. I was in radio communications with the assault force commander, Scott Miller, who you may recognize that name is now four-star General Scott Miller in charge of all forces in Afghanistan. So we were able to do a face-to-face -face link up and then in place the 10th Mountain Division in a security perimeter without any type of uh, incidents with the, the Rangers and the Delta personnel already on the ground. Now we could focus on getting the pilots and co-pilots bodies out of the helicopter that were trapped inside there. And this is what I was talking to you about earlier about I will never leave a fallen comrade. We had two of our comrades stuck in that helicopter. It would have been very easy and probably the logical thing to do to get everyone picked up and moved out back to the rally point and back to a safe area. But we're Americans, we simply don't do that. We don't leave our people behind. So even though we were taking fire and taking some minor casualties, fortunately, we had no further deaths. It took several hours, but we were able to get the pilots and co-pilots bodies out of that crumpled Black Hawk helicopter into one of the Malaysian APCs and then drive back to a safe location. I, I want to stress the point that while every element of the warrior ethos was applicable during that battle, as it is in every battle before and since then. As I said to you initially, I wanted to focus on that last point. I will never leave a fallen comrade. That's critical for the culture of whatever unit you're in. And once you're no longer in the Air Force for whatever business company organization you have to be working with, people have to know that no matter how bad things get, whether it's in combat, whether it's in everyday life, anywhere in between, that they'll never be left behind. For that to happen, that has to be part of the culture. And so I'll leave you with this final thought. Be the person that everyone knows will never leave a fallen comrade. Thanks for your attention. As I said, it's an honor for me to be with you today. And at this time, I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you.